Good morning, everyone. We're sorry for the late start, but we've had some technical difficulties this morning, but we're ready to begin. Let me just go through a couple of quick technology announcements. Note that your microphones and cameras have been muted to conserve bandwidth, but we do want you to ask questions. If you're joining us in Zoom, if you'll tap the Q&A button and type your question in at the end of the program, we will make sure that it gets asked. If you're watching us in Facebook, you can put it in as comments or post right under the video and I'll monitor, it, monitor Facebook to make sure that your question also gets asked. Uh, after the fact, you can watch the recording in Facebook or you can watch it on our YouTube channel. Remember, if you're not sure how to get to either one of those, you can go to the registration page for upcoming events and tap the Facebook or the YouTube buttons to watch anything you'd like to on demand. Okay, Jane, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Thank you, Mary Louise. Welcome to our October membership meeting. My name is Jane Spruill and I'm the president for the Pensacola Bay Area League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, which means we do not support nor oppose any particular candidate or party. In an election year, such as 2020, this one, the League encourages informed and active participation in government through voting. We've worked diligently this year to register eligible voters and to recruit volunteers to work at the precinct polling sites. The League organizes and, organizes and moderates public rallies, forums, where we get uh, an opportunity to meet and learn about the candidates. We speak to local community groups about the amendments and other ballot issues. And we distrib distributed throughout both counties a written guide to voters. I'm very proud to invite you to register for the upcoming events. Over the past couple of months, we have produced, hosted, and, and aired rallies and forums to give voters more opportunities to meet and learn about the candidates. Our final program is called Meet the Candidates, in fact, and is scheduled for Tuesday, October 20th at 7 p.m. This event is an open invitation session for local and state level candidates to speak and respond to audience questions. You may register for this and all of our events via our Facebook page, League of Women Voters, Pensacola Bay Area. Also, our November Saturday morning membership meeting will be host, in that meeting, we will be hosting Dr. Jean Siebenayler to present the updates and understanding more about what's happening with COVID-19 at that point. This event will take place on November 21st in a Zoom meeting, and it starts also at 1015. We are especially excited to welcome and introduce our regular membership and, our, and their guest. These Saturday morning member meetings are public events and, are, and we welcome and encourage the community to attend. We believe that these monthly meetings are one of our most impressive efforts. We hope to inspire women and men to consider membership in the League of Women Voters. We, are, we will be hosting another Waffles and Wisdom meeting sometime in January. And this is new member training and opportunities to engage these new members in the various aspects of the League of Women Voters. As we get closer to January, look for the specific date and time for that meeting. Today, we welcome a team of our own membership to, to the stage to present important and critical information about the ballot. This ballot represents how we as voters are able to have a voice and become involved in, our, in government. It is our individual responsibility to be an empowered voter, to learn about the candidates, the ballot and other issues ensures that we are educated and informed when we mark this ballot. Each of us has one vote 
the vote. <clears throat> the team of speakers today <clears throat> program includes three of our members. First is Charlotte Parrish, a retired RN and a league member for over 15 years. She is the current chair for the Voter Services Committee and has had extensive work in the precincts polling sites before this uh, Voter Services Chair, chair Committee uh, position. In a general election year and the year of the COVID-19 pandemic, and then throw in a couple of hurricanes, you can likely imagine what her world of voter services has been like. Joining Charlotte will be Dr. Paula Montgomery. She is a retired family physician and a league member since 1984. That's 36 years. She's held many leadership positions in the league and her interest in the welfare of children led her to chair both the education and the juvenile justice committees. You see, if you're really good at your job, we give you more to do like a second committee and she could handle it. The third team member is Haley Richards, a member of the League of Women Voters for more than 10 years. She has served as co-president from 2013 to 2018. That's five years, Haley. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of, of uh, responsibility and leadership. She has worked on several voter services projects and currently she is a teacher of social studies in a local Catholic school. I turn it over to you, Charlisle, to give us all the information we need about the vote. Well, I'm so glad to be here. I do hope you can hear me. I will try to speak up or yell uh, so that you can here because I've been having some computer problems this morning. <laughs> so Mary Louise, we're going to talk about the amendments that are on your ballot. So I may need a little direction. Sure, all, all you need to do is hit the green button that says share screen and then choose your PowerPoint and open it. Okay, one of these days I'll understand all this Zoom. Um, How about that? Oh. Can you see the slides? No. Oh. Did you hit share screen first? Yes, ma'am. And then did you pick your PowerPoint? Was your PowerPoint already open on your computer? Yep. Hmm. I'll tell, I'll tell you what might be easier. Would it be okay if I brought the PowerPoint up and you just tell me when it's time to move the slides? Okay. That's Would that fine. be okay? All right. Now I, I have to go open it first, so bear with me, folks. You want me to try it again? You can try it again, but I, I've got I've got it now. If you need me, I'll be your backup. There we go. There, you've got it now, Charlisle. Okay, great, folks. So, you know, the constitutional amendments what I, are interesting in that in our Florida Constitution, these proposed constitutional amendments, assuming they are um, approved by our, the voters, then they're going to be integrated into our Florida Constitution. Whereas in the federal Constitution, they are listed at the uh, end of the, the your Constitution, at the end of the Constitution. So that's a little bit different between the two um, items. And today we have six Florida proposed amendments on our general election uh, ballot, and you will see them there. Now, do remember when we get to these amendments that you've already uh, seen on your ballot all of the um, uh, folks running for the different positions. We then have the uh, judges, including one Supreme Court and six of the um, uh, uh, Court of Appeal 
that we're asked to decide whether we want to retain them or not, then comes our uh, constitutional amendments. So we have six, four of which are citizens initiatives, two are um, the um, legislature. Now, remember, in order to be getting into our um, constitution, we, the voters, we have to have 60% of those voting on that particular amendment in order to get into the constitution. So let's move on. Then we have amendment one, and this is a um, citizens initiative sponsored by the Florida citizen voters. And what they are proposing for us to uh, vote on is replacing one word, word right currently replace the phrase every citizen of the United States with only a citizen uh, of the United States. So it's just one word they're asking us to make this uh, change. Some have been afraid that um, we, there may be some non-citizens that have been um, on our rolls. And so they feel that this is, um, uh, but that this would help with that. You know, uh, back in 2012, they investigated about 180,000 names of the 13 million that are registered and found only 85 that were not eligible uh, to vote. So a very, very tiny amount of the uh, registered voters in our state. So what you're going to be asked is a vote yes, you want to replace every with only a citizen in the existing constitution, or do you say no, we'll keep the current every citizen of the United States um, to vote. One of the, the reasons they wanted that the, some people felt that, uh, you, you know, we were wanting to make sure of the citizenship. So that is amendment one. Amendment two, we go into, and in this one, we are asking the voting uh, voters to increase our minimum wage. Currently, our minimum wage in the state of Florida is $8.56 an hour. And as of September 30th, if this amendment should pass, as of September 30th, 2021, it would automatically go to $10 an hour. Then what we have is starting in uh, September 30th again of 2022, the minimum wage will increase annually by $1 an hour until it reaches $15 an hour on, uh, in 2026. And thereafter, it will increase by the rate of, infect, of the inflation. So, um, Currently, left at the current rate of the um, eight fifty six an hour, a person working full time and rate and uh, would get seventeen thousand eight hundred dollars a year for a full time person, which is hardly adequate to uh, for a family of four. Maybe requiring some of those family members to have second or third jobs by increasing it to the $15 an hour, it is a wee bit more that somebody would be able to not only pay the rent, the food and the medications, but may also um, be able to buy more goods. So therefore, though some people are afraid that um, they were going to have to um, spend a lot more, the business people would, or have to raise prices, what we probably see instead is that with the increased buying power, then they'll be selling um, more. 
uh, items for sale. And, but then there are others. So a vote yes would uh, incrementally uh, go up to $15 an hour and a vote no would keep the current minimum wage at eight fifty six, um, which is probably the rate that a lot of, um, some of our folks do have that and a lot of the teenagers in our fast food are making um, that. So we have to consider whether we want people to have a, a wage that is a closer to a living wage for basic um, items for ourselves. So vote yes would increase and vote no would keep it as it is. And that is amendment two. Don't forget that if you have any questions about the amendment that you can uh, write them down and ask us later or uh, put it in the chat box and we'll be glad to, um, to answer your questions. And then on to amendment three. Now, um, in amendment three, what we have is sort of a unique situation where currently, you know, we have the, our primary elections that we have, whether it's a presidential in the spring or whether it's our typical August um, um, uh, primary election as we just had on August the 18th, we are asking for a close, an open primary situation for select um, positions. And this is this is for the state legislature, uh, our House of Representatives, Senate, our governor, and the two elected positions that are elected in the in the cabinet, and those two would be your uh, Commissioner of Agriculture and your Chief Financial Officer are the two other elected positions. Now, what you're seeing here too is that this is not going to take effect until 2024. So what, you, what we have then is we'll continue with the primary as a closed primary for these individuals, but um, starting in 2024. Now, what will happen then is that the, um, let me go forward here. It will allow then for these positions only, this does not apply to the president, it does not apply to the county commissioners and so forth. So when we, it will allow that all voters and what we have is in the state of Florida, we have approximately 14 million registered voters. And of that 3.4 of those have a no party affiliation, which takes them totally out of the scene for a closed primary. They would, can only vote once the primary is over in the general election. So by putting an open primary um, for these particular positions, then that would allow approximately 3.4 um, of our nonpartisan affiliates to uh, register. And we're seeing that more and more of our younger um, citizens are opting instead of uh, signing up as a Democrat or a Republican, they are doing no party affiliation. And what is also interesting, if you'll follow me just a second. So if this doesn't take effect until 2024, our next election, which is in uh, 2022, and that is the election that we vote again for our governor and those cabinet positions. But this doesn't take effect until 2024. So that means that the governor and cabinet will, will stay um, at our closed primary until, and then, so that's what's gonna happen now. But then in 2024, it goes into effect in January well, 2024 is a presidential election. So that means that we'll have the presidential 
Um, but this does not apply to the presidential thing. So except for in August, where we may have some state legislators, of which if we voted yes, we it would open it up as an open primary for the state legislator, we aren't going to be voting for governor or the cabinet in 2024. So it will be after that particular uh, time frame. Now, all state candidates um, will be shown on a single primary ballot, regardless of party. And even the way this is set up, none of the um, candidates have to have their party affiliation even listed on the um, on the ballot. So you might not know even what party they are um, uh, listed for. If so, then after the primary, open primary, the top two vote getters will then go on to November for the general election. If, however, for a particular um, candidate, um, like a, um, a, a um, let's say a, a senator or a representative, there are only two people vying for that position then there will not be a primary. It will automatically go to November for the general um, election. Um, what we find is that the closed primary tends to lead in very hyper partisanship. And this, and so therefore, um, what the open primary would do would get a broader a broader state slate of um, more diverse candidates, attract more moderate candidates, and would definitely increase voter participation, which we do not get from the uh, nonpartisan folks in our August races. Um, the what you also may find is in uh, is that you may even be voting in November for two people of the same party because you don't necessarily know what party they are um, uh, affiliated with. Uh, if you voted for the open primaries, it would might discourage uh, from people catering to their base, which we see a lot in our current elections. So a vote yes would establish a top two open primary system for state legislators, governor and cabinet, and keep a vote no would keep the current system going as it is with the closed uh, primary. So that is amendment three and on to uh, amendment number four. And then an amendment number four um, is an amendment uh, that will determine uh, about how we approve constitutional amendments. Now, every year that we are voting on amendments, they are sequentially numbered, one, two, three, four. And uh, two years ago, when we had an amendment four, that had to do with the felons and their voting rights. Today, we have amendment number four, a totally different amendment, remembering that all of our amendments are integrated into our constitution. So this year, number four says that it would require all of us to uh, approve an amendment in two separate elections. So if this was in effect to, today, as an example, these amendments would then have to be approved and then they would go into, we wouldn't be able to finalize them until two years, which would mean it would be brought back to the voter in 2022 and it would have to be approved again before it gets into the constitution with the same 60% approval rate, which yeah, many have said that in voting, if we, put this into effect that it may make it more difficult and a lot more expensive for voters to be able to uh, propose an amendment 
and to uh, get in for the citizens to actually get these amendments um, in our constitution. So a vote yes would require voters to approve a constitutional amendment a second time. So we vote this year and then two more years we'd have to wait. It would be brought back to us at probably considerable, again, considerable amount of time and money. Whereas if we vote now, uh, vote no, then it would, would uh, keep the current uh, situation where we 60% vote approves, it goes into the constitution. So um, it, it, and, there, and what we have is a less restrictive process for for um, voters to uh, get the uh, amendments. If they're good, you know, my theory is if they're good and solid uh, amendments, then they should be put in with the original 60%. Uh, what the people who brought this to us were worried about is any kind of uh, foo foo amendments that they didn't want, uh, we felt that they needed uh, approval for the second time for voters. Um, so vote yes means two different elections to get uh, one in and a vote no says it'll stay the same way. So now we have, we'll go on into amendment four, um, I mean amendment five. And Amendment 5 has to do with the homestead uh, exemption. Many people in our state um, have homestead exemption. And what it currently is, and it goes into effect in January, as you can see, is that you can sell your house and transfer that tax benefit to your new home. And you have two years to do that. What we're asked, what they're asking us to do, this is the Florida legislator bringing that to us, is that it would in, uh, take us from two years to three years. Remembering that that those taxes and those and the tax saving for the homeowner, but it is does reduce the amount of taxes that the county can collect. Um, for schools, police, and so forth. So their budgets are having to jiggle that around uh, with the homestead exemption. What they did, some say, is that some people uh, selling a house at the end of the year have less time period than the two years. Um, they may only have a year and a couple months or something like that. So by putting, um, uh, next year, going from two years to three years, that some people might get that benefit um, better. But it also takes away, as you can see, the preempting our home rule on the um, the county's ability to uh, raise taxes. So what you have here on Amendment 5 is a if you say yes, then it would extend that transferring from two years to three years. Uh, but it will also at the same time, meaning at the same time, we are not giving that taxes to the, to the community. Um, a no vote would save it like it would continue with the current um, two-year uh, time period. And our last amendment five, I mean six, is um, another uh, tax um, um, amendment, whereby now when a veteran with permanent disabilities, they also can apply and get property tax discounts, but upon their death, then that discount stops. What this is asking the voters to consider is to continue that tax discount uh, to their spouses once the veteran um, has um, died. 
and the spouse though would not continue on uh, upon her marriage or selling the house and so forth. So that again, it's that less property taxes during the time that the spouse has that tax discount um, benefit. So that's the state control over our look somewhat over our local um, uh, budgets and so forth. So what we so therefore what we have here is a vote yes would extend that homestead property tax to our uh, spouses of uh, combat injured veterans that have been awarded that a no would say it would not extend it to the spouse once that individual has um, has died. And so we're going to finish this up with remembering that early voting does start on Monday for both counties, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And the locations for that is in um, the um, is online. If you don't know where those early voting places are, or I have a list that I can give you later. And so now we're going to go on in after the amendments, then we have referendums and Paula will um, now discuss uh, one of the referendums. Okay. So you just need to stop sharing uh, press the red button next to the green one to stop sharing your screen. Um, <laughs> it's gone. Okay, I'll, I'll take care of it. I think I can okay. do it from my side. Wait a minute. No, I don't want to resume. Can you do it? I can do oh, it. I see it. I see. Okay, I, I got it. Oh, thank you. Okay, no problem. So, Paula, give me a second to get your... Um, PowerPoint up. That's very brief. No problem. If you live in Escambia County, the very last thing you will see on your ballot, the very last place that you can vote is a, pro a proposal for a something called a, a Children's Services Council. And it, they've given it the name, the Children's Trust. So what is a Children's Services Council? Well, it's an organization that provides funding for children's programs in a coordinated, fiscally sound process. It will collect data, it will monitor performance, and it will conduct planning. It will serve as a hub for child advocacy. We kind of need a hub, I think, in, the, in Escambia County. We all know there are many, many different programs uh, for children in Escambia County. The Children's Trust will provide coordination and oversight and augment funding for these. And it will eliminate many of the gaps in services that now exist. You may wonder why it's needed since we have these program, uh, but these statistics, the next slide, will tell the story of why it's needed. Apparently, despite the fact that we have many very good programs, there are gaps. 53%, that's over half of our children, are not ready for kindergarten when they reach the uh, appropriate age. We have the fourth highest reported child abuse cases out of our 67 counties, with the third highest in juvenile arrests, and we are at the bottom one-third in child wellness. So apparently there are gaps that need to be filled. So that is why we, that is why this is being proposed. Next slide. Is there a proven model that Escambia County can follow in setting up a children's services council? And the answer is yes. This particular type of program has worked well for a number of years in nine other counties in Florida. It will be on the ballot this year in Leon County and in Escambia County. Okay, the big question is how much will it cost? Next slide. Mm. 
this is not the right slide. Oh, sorry, let me go. Did I skip one? I don't know. Either I got them out of order or something. Here, let me go forward a couple and see. There's the cost. That's it. This is the cost. The money will be raised from a millage on real estate, and it will cost Escambia County homeowners about $40 a year, and it's projected to be for a 10-year span. This money will fund the program in a consistent way. It won't be dependent on applying for grants that may expire, and it will be not dependent on going around fundraising all the time and looking for well-heeled donors. Now we back to that other slide. What will the money buy? It will be focused on local problems and opportunities. If this referendum passes, it will begin a process to determine what the final focus will be. Based on current statistics about our community, the Children's Trust will likely prioritize programs that will reach more than 50,000 children. You can see here how it will be divided up ready children. This is getting them ready for uh, that crucial readiness for kindergarten. Ready youth will uh, have to do with out of school time, career readiness, enrichment programs, adolescents and teens, and ready families will focus on stable, strengthened families, homes and communities. And that is how it will reach those, uh, those 50,000 children. The very first action would be to commission an independent needs assessment using public input to determine the most pressing needs. That will determine the final initial, or the final key focus areas. By the way, this is not a league sponsored initiative. However, it is on the ballot and members of the league are all interested in learning as much as possible about what is on the ballot. In fact, to that end, the League sponsored a Zoom meeting with the organization sponsoring this initiative. It is recorded. It can be found on the events page where you signed up for this program. And you can click on previous events on demand and you can look for a more complete explanation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paula. So Haley, over to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to kind of wrap up today's meeting with um, a walkthrough and demonstration of one of my special projects over the last few months, which is the Vote 411 website, which is a part of the League of Women Voters Education Fund efforts to provide a one stop shop uh, to voters for all election related information. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and pull it up. So I just wanted to kind of walk you through the site, so hopefully you can see it. So it's a really simple to go to vote411.org. Um, and so this is the home screen and you can see that there's all kinds of information uh, related to the election, particularly us who live in Florida. So it is um, designed to give you state specific um, information because sometimes, you know, as we know, um, voting and the ways that you vote and how you um, register to vote, if you have identification requirements, all those different things sometimes change. Um, and it's hard sometimes for all of us to keep track of those changes. So this is a great way to do that. Um, if you uh, know anyone that still needs to register to vote, um, this will take you um, to the online voter registration system for Florida. Um, you can check on your voter registration status just in case you're a little bit unsure. Um, and then, of course, what we as the League have been working on locally and at the state level, as well as the National League, um, working on the what's going to be on your ballot. So the method that you can actually compare candidates. Um, and so part of the work that I've been doing um, is to, to reach out to our local candidates in the two county area, um, which is what our League serves in Escambia and Santa Rosa, um, and reach out to them with a short survey of candidate information. Um, as well as some uh, questions that, uh, as the league, we feel like are important to our voters in our area um, and to see where the candidate stands on certain issues related to the office in which they are seeking. Um, so if you click uh, any of those three uh, sections of the site, um, it will take you uh, to another section. Um, so I have already kind of queued up the find out what's on your ballot. Um, but it's a pretty simple process. Um, I'll just click on it here and you can see that you have to enter in your home address. 
Um, so it does use, you know, your personal address. So it'll pull out, you know, if you live in a specific district, which I know um, in Escambia, you know, it depends on the district in which you live, if you live in the city versus the county. Um, so it will prompt you with some of those questions to determine where you live and to pull up the ballot um, uh, for you. So it's the same, you know, candidates and information that you would get from the sample ballots um, that the supervisor of elections um, sends out to us. So once you do that, um, it's going to bring you to this page. So I'll just kind of scroll down. Um, I kind of queued this up already for the presentation, but you can see um, that you can click on, um, you know, up from the president. Once you do that, it'll tell you a little bit about the office. Um, in case you want to brush up on that, um, it does include some of the Spanish translation information as well. Um, and then you can see that um, the candidates who have responded will show up with their picture if they provided that. Um, and then if they didn't provide any information, it'll just give you um, a little message that says this candidate has not responded. So you can see that you just click through so you can go through, you know, from president um, to our candidates running for the congressional district for District 1. Um, if you live in Escambia County, uh, which I do, you just go through the list of candidates. They're not always in the same information uh, or the same not information, but the same order that they appear. And that's just kind of the way the site does it. Um, so unfortunately, I can't really, I wish I could change that. Um, but you can just go through and you can see um, all the different races that will appear on your ballot. Um, if you want to go ahead and kind of decide who you're going to vote for, you can like check these boxes. Um, and then at the end, it will show you um, who, who you've selected so that when you do, you know, either go to the um, vote early um, or if you go on election day or you're filling out your ballot at home, um, then you can already have, have your plan of who you're going to vote for um, to make it faster. So you can see it even has our um, local referendum that Paula um, just talked about, um, as well as, you know, going through the amendments that Charlisle talked about. Um, and then towards the end, you can see there's lots of things. Um, and then it gets into even the, um, all of the amendments that Charlisle talked to us about uh, this morning. One thing that's unique about Florida is we do have judicial merit retention. Um, so it will also have some of the information um, about what is judicial merit retention um, that you can find out about it, um, kind of what the process is, why am I being asked to vote on judges on our ballot? Um, so that's something a little bit unique to us in Florida. Um, and then it'll just go through and tell you a little, you know, biography about the justices that are up for retention. Um, the Florida Bar also puts out some information too, so you can visit the Florida Bar website as well. Um, so like I said, Vote 411 has a lot of information. It's designed um, you know, with the voters in mind. Um, they've had, this is site has been around and kind of evolved over time since 2006. Um, and then as a local league and those uh, legal and voters of Florida, we've been working on it, I believe at least the last two election cycles, maybe even three. Um, so it's just a way for voters to, to be informed as much as possible. Um, compare the candidates on certain issues that are asking for your vote. Um, I will say that if you live in Santa Rosa, um, I believe most of the local races in Santa Rosa were decided at the primary. Um, so the, if you live in Escambia uh, County, we, we have several local uh, uh, candidates running in the general this time around. So um, you may not see, depending on your where you live in the district in which you live in. There are a couple local races who have write-in candidates, so we did not include um, those races on Vote 411. So like the clerk of court, for example, is on the ballot, um, but they're not listed on Vote 411 because um, the incumbent is facing a write-in candidate. Um, so I think that's the same for one of the county commission races as well. Um, so hopefully if this helps a little bit to navigate the site and what's available to you, um, like I said, you can share it with friends if they're asking you as a league member, uh, what, you know, where can they go to find out information? Um, it's very simple to enter in their address um, and find out all of what they need. Um, even if you start up at the menu, it'll just ask you, you know, to select your state. And then it'll walk you through some of the um, information that, again, is specific to Florida, since that's where we live, like all of the election dates, some of the deadlines that are specific to us. Um, 
you know, the process. So I love this part on the side, the, the Florida voting information. So, um, you know, all the frequently asked questions, you know, if you don't know, or if someone asks you, um, you know, this is a site where you can go and get, you know, accurate information um, and provide that to anyone who maybe you're in your circle of voters that you can help out and make sure that everyone um, is fully informed with accurate information um, and they're ready to, to cast their vote either by mail, uh, early voting, or on election day. Um, so that's all I wanted to just specifically share about the site, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, if anyone has any. So I'll turn it back over to um, either Jane or Mary Louise. So I'll stop sharing. All righty. Thanks, Haley. Well, uh I don't see any questions out on Facebook. We do have some people watching on Facebook though. And uh, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box here at the bottom. Audience members, do you have any questions? We'll wait a couple seconds for you to type them in if you just thought of something you wanted to ask. I, I don't see any responses. So Jane, I'll turn it back to you to close the meeting. Thank you, Mary Louise. I wanna say a, a, a big thank you to these three members of our association. And the presentation you gave this morning is so important. It's the essence of what we do. And, um, you know, it's a big ballot. I, I have mine and I'm trying to work through parts of it every day before I get it turned in. And one of the things that's so important is to have the information that you presented this morning. You just don't know how important that is, or maybe you do, to all the citizens that are out there ready to vote. Thank you so much. And uh, I guess the last thing I'd like to say is just please join us for our future events. You know how to uh, find us. Go to Facebook, uh, League of Women Voters, Pensacola Bay Area. And you can register for the upcoming Meet the Candidates session on Tuesday and also uh, to our next month's meeting in November. Thank you so much and hope to see you again. Okay, great. Goodbye, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting now, if that's okay with everyone.